welcome everyone. Um, this is the first of this year's lecture series events, and we are so pleased to have our first guest with us today, Norm Newberry. Norm is a 1965 graduate of the architecture program at Notre Dame. And um, before we get to his introduction, I'd like to take a moment to recognize three members of the class of 1965 who have come to support Norm today. Uh, John Gillen. <laughs> Jim Childs, <laughs> and Tom Connolly. Fifty-four years after graduation, they are still close friends, as I'm sure many of you will be. And uh, remember that as you look around at your classmates today, you will be stuck with them forever. <laughs> So Norm Newberry was born and raised in Hollywood. He learned his trade as he was growing up from his father, Bill Newberry, who was first an architect and eventually spent 40 years working in the film industry as an art director. His father is actually a double domer, receiving his Bachelor of Architecture from Notre Dame in 1934 and a master's degree in 1937. Norm began his motion picture career in the mid-60s as a set designer in one of the last of the large studio system art departments at Universal Studios. He subsequently served as an officer with the Navy Seabees before rejoining the Universal Art Department as an art director in the early 70s. He worked on many television series as well as features, and during a slowdown of film work in the late 80s, Norm found a home at Universal Creative and spent 14 years as executive art director and design director for all of Universal's studio theme parks and backlot set streets. He completed his 14 years at Universal Creative as vice president of design for Universal Studios Japan. In 2002, Norm returned to the motion picture industry, reinventing himself as a motion capture art director. He has worked on all the films to date that were entirely motion captured from Polar Express to Avatar. He invented the term Space Wrangler, used to describe production design in the virtual world and its relationship to real-time performances. Currently, Norm consults with themed environment design companies, film schools, and film studios, advising them in their quest to provide the best placemaking and storytelling experiences. Norm continues his active involvement in the Art Directors Guild and the Designers Branch of the Academy of Motion Pictures, Arts, and Sciences. In 2018, Norm received the Lifetime Achievement Award from the Art Directors Guild. So we are trying something new this year. While Norm will talk a little bit about his work as we get started, the overall concept for this event is a conversation. Norm has had a very exciting career and an extensive affiliation with Notre Dame, and we want to be sure to explore as much of it as we can with our limited time and benefit from all, from all of his stories. At the end of the event, I will also open the floor to your questions. So please join me in welcoming Mr. Norm Newberry back to Notre Dame. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks very much. Can you all hear me way back there? Okay, cool. Um, it's great being here. Um, thank you for inviting me. Uh, I um, uh, always feel like I'm at my home or my second home when I'm here. It's, a, it's a, an emotional experience to be here. Anyway, let me start you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you about 15 minutes of stuff I did in my career. And I hope that I can get it done that quick. So I'm, I'm going to really flash through some of them. This is what the campus looked like when me and my friends were here. And you can see this is in our last year. So they were actually building the library the whole time we were studying here. And although we never got an official tour of the building while it was under construction, we would steal our way in there quite a lot. And we learned a lot about architecture just digging through the construction site there. I have a great photograph I took of the moon rising from the roof of the building when it was just a steel framework and there was down below was a guard trying to find who that fool was up there in the dark. <laughs> so, but the, you could see there was not nothing much south of the library uh, and south of the of the engineering building which is just to the left of center and the, and the law school south of there there was nothing. So now it's all the heart of the campus today. So that's what it looked like back then. This is the architecture building which is um, uh, I must have bumped the button. Let's see if I can make it go away here. 
Uh, there we go. Okay. Um, there, this used to be the music college, and it's now nothing, or getting converted into something. And it's, it's uh, uh, directly next to the La Fortune Student Center. A and that was the architecture school. We were there. This is the, the crux of my class in that picture. And uh, in the lower left, you can see me and Tom Conley, who's here, and John Gillen, uh, supine on the, on the ground. <laughs> Jim Childs is in the back on the right, but his, his, there's only half of his face. I think he was very shy. This is what it looked like inside. We had two huge drafting rooms like this, an, an, an attachment on the building that was one story high with a drafting room in it. Across, about 50 yards away, in the, the place where the huddle is, which you could see by the sign at the very top, was originally the science center when it was first designed along with the main building and uh, Soren Hall. So that was where the huddle and the student center was. On the third floor was where the thesis students were and where all the uh, freshman drawing classes were. So that's where we were. These are the kind of design projects I did. Uh, the, the other members of the class here did a much better job than I. This is what we, we built our own history books. We, we had a professor named Ernest Brandel who taught us six semesters of architectural history. And he was not happy with any book on architectural history. So we had to make our own based on his notes and we had to get, do the research, find the buildings and do drawings of them. This is a, one of the things I'm proud of in my stay here. We found our way into the place between the two domes, between the golden dome and the inside dome with the painting of Our Lady and the angels on it. We stole a trip up there one afternoon. That's Tom Conley, and that's myself behind him, and there were two others of us from our class, and we just were on an adventure to find out how things were put together. We got up there, and we didn't have a camera. I never took a picture, but... This is, shows you my ability as a photoshopper today. So, so there's actually a photograph in the New York, I mean, excuse me, in the Notre Dame magazine of the guy that did the maintenance and, and, he, and they were showing in the article places that Notre Dame students never go to. So that's his body, but it's Tom's face and then me in the background. <laughs> this is my first job out of Notre Dame. So I'm... Uh, I'm working in the art department at Universal Studios in uh, North Hollywood. And this is Alex Glitzen, the head of the uh, art department. And this is, I'm, you can see I'm drafting up a set. So that, that was the first job I had. And I'll tell you later, probably in our conversation, how I got there. These are the kind of movies I would, now these actual movies were in 1961. And um, I was, uh, uh, after my freshman year here, I got a job working as a blueprinter in the art department and an office boy. And uh, the, you see the movie on the right, that touch of mink. That's I did drawings for this set. So if you look carefully, you can see there's neon signs on the buildings out in the distance in New York. I did the drawings for the for the uh, uh, neon signs. They were about this wide and about this tall. And they're on a backing on plywood on the back of the stage. And then the other drawing I did was a layout of where this set fit in the stage, the largest stage at Universal. That was my first real genuine drawing that I ever got to do in the film industry was that. When I graduated and came back as a, as a real genuine set designer, which means a draftsman in movie, movie terms, these are the movies I worked on. Thoroughly Modern, Millie in the Middle, shows you how my training in architectural history and design really set me up for these kinds of sets. You know, This is classical architecture while, at a time when we were interested in, cal in classical architecture. So they helped me with... Uh, the back lot set, and here's Millie hanging off the front of uh, a building. So I had to know about all that detailing to do the drawings to be able to do that. An another movie that, that my other career helped me with is Nobody's Perfect in the Middle. There's a scene in that on the bridge of a small Navy ship in the middle of a storm. So this is a bridge uh, tossing around on a gimbal with special effects fire hoses making waves. And I had to come up with all of this, and my research was my experience in the Navy, although I was never on a ship. I was, I was with the Seabees, and I was always on shore. And here's an example, a movie in the middle, Pete and Tilly. I got, this is the kind of working drawings I were doing. So that's my working drawing. The little sketch that's on the right is a real genuine art director's sketch done on a napkin in a bar. So, so after they found the location for this set in San Francisco, they went across the street, went to the bar and sat down. The production designer said, 
this is what I want it to look like. He got back to the studio, threw that on my desk and said, draw it up. And so that I go to the next step. And then after that, they would do a sketch of what it looked like. Got to work on an oddball movie like Slaughterhouse-Five. Got to work on a sting. This is fabulous. These, these shots from the sting, the top half of them is a painting. It's done on glass. It's photo doubled into the movie. So the back lot set down below in New York, or Chicago, I mean, and the, and the L and all that was a real set. Everything above is a painting. And I learned about the tricks of putting all this together. And my basis for that was the great training I got in perspective drawing here. Here's the two of my buddies from that film, Paul Newman and Robert Redford. Got to know both of them. Earthquake, I got, I got to put Charlton Heston in all this. So I was, I was even drawing destroyed buildings. That, was, that were the sets I was doing. I got to work on Jaws, mainly doing details for the boat that you see in the bottom there, the Orca. But I looked, did a little bit on Quint's place, that building in the, in the lower picture on the upper right, upper left side, I'm sorry. I'm looking at this backwards. So I got to work on the Hindenburg. This some of my drawings of the, of the dirigible. Learn a lot about dirigibles. The photograph you see at the top on the right is, uh, is a miniature of the Hindenburg that flies in the movie. And it's about 30 feet long. The actual Hindenburg was 1,000 feet long. And I got to do the drawings for that. And this miniature is hanging above the store in the Smithsonian's Air, and, uh, Air Museum in, in Washington, D.C. So my project ended up there. It's fully motorized and, and can do all the things it needs to do in the movie. The bow, the interior of the bow of the set is uh, the other piece I worked on in that movie. And so there's the miniature flying at the top. There's the bow being destroyed at the end of the movie. The, you see the, the gondola right below the red lettering, the Hindenburg. That's the, uh, the size of it compared to the ship, and that's the actual size of it. That was drawn by a friend of mine, and that went to the Smithsonian after the movie was over. And now it's in New Jersey in the hangar at, uh, at the field where the Hindenburg crashed and burned. Got to work on a Western. Got to throw John Houston off a building into the streets of New York. Here I am working on that part of it where, where the, we're getting the background for this shot. Then the rest was on a screen, on, uh, on a stage with a blue screen behind it. And I also, in that picture, we got to do the president's helicopter from the JFK era. And uh, I flew in a helicopter from Palm Springs, I mean from, uh, um, I can't think of the name of it, Death Valley, from Death Valley back to Santa Monica Airport. And when we landed, there were six cars that pulled out on the field full of people that wanted to see the president, and it was just me. <laughs> we got to build a huge set on that one. It was a, uh, the largest soundstage at MGM full of computers and abstract stuff. This is where my training at, at Notre Dame really began to kick in. Here's, here's Rome. This is Caesar's Palace in history of the world. And everything I knew about classical architecture is in Caesar's Palace. It's right there. And here's the outside of Rome, which is on the back lot at Universal. And then we added all this stuff to them. And you notice it's curiously weird and undone and has California mountains in the background. That's because in the movie, we did another one of those paintings and added the top of Rome. And, and it all marries with all the action and everything down below. Those are called map paintings. Nowadays, they're done on computers, and, and they're uh, easier to do optically, more difficult to do painting-wise. Uh, we did the dungeons of a Spanish uh, castle for uh, the Inquisition scenes where Mel Brooks gets to see it's, it's a great, it's the Inquisition, what a show. The Inquisition, we got to go. He's trying to convert the Jews to Catholicism. It ends up with the nuns swimming in a pool around the Jews, trying to get them to be to be Catholics, and it doesn't happen. It doesn't work. I got to do small sets like this, but the reason there was a small set is, I mean, it's not a very significant ordinary building is because this is a building that was going to blow up and burn down in the movie. So that's why we had to build it. Uh, took a really beautiful Victorian home, added a tower to it, made it look like a wreck in uh, upstate New York for Ghost Story. Here's Dolly in her bedroom in the best little whorehouse in Texas. And uh, uh, she was great to work with. There's some sketches that I did to help the director understand how the beginning of the movie might work. We built the, the, the exterior twice. And the second time was on stage in the largest stage at Universal with all the interiors. My daughter, who was nine years old at the time, loved it. And later on, when we were in a dollhouse shop buying furniture for her dollhouse, she saw this big house and she said, oh, daddy, look, 
It must be an apartment or a whorehouse or something. <laughs> we left. You know? <laughs> We were, my wife and I were careful to talk about, we were working on the best little tech, the best little house in Texas, so I don't know how she found out the right name. <laughs> Nobody really paid attention to the magnificent set that we did for that movie. <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> so, uh, on this film, we got to do a big, huge dining room on a cruise ship, and I got to do the Mediterranean on a painting that would go up and down on a steel pipe so that it looked like the ship was rolling. So that was a trick that I learned for that one. And the, the lights are down in lower than the number, but the, the sunlight could go up and down too. So it looked like the ship was rolling a little bit. Sylvester Stallone directing, John Travolta acting. What else can I tell you? And we built a whole farm on a piece of property in northern Tennessee and 40 acres of corn and 40 acres of wheat. And we built a levee in the background and we built a, a temporary dam across the Holston River and we were able to control the river and bring it up and then we could break the levee at a special effects place that was built in, into it. And we could flood the farm. So that was the crooks of the story. These people, Mel Gibson and Sissy Spacek lose their farm in the movie. So here's another small set, but this was a, a motorcycle gang's home in California, an old craftsman house that had been sort of badly remodeled. So I got to do some bad architecture for that as Cher and Eric Stoltz being uh, a, a kid who really had this disease that had deformed his face. And th this is where I got to make a deal with the, with the 15th Street gang in East Los Angeles. So I, I was showing this location to the director and uh, this car, this Chevy that was all tricked out comes slowly driving up. And these kids got out and they were gangbangers for sure. And they came walking up to us and I said, I'll, I'll talk to them. And I went up and and the, the kid in the front put his finger on my shoulder and he says, you guys from production? <laughs> and they showed me photographs of he and his girlfriend in the last movie they worked on. And they said, this is our neighborhood. You work here, you hire us. So they're in the movie. <laughs> <laughs> and this is, a, this is a drawing I did for a, a cabin that we built in Canada for a movie. And we built it out of real logs and real stone. And the reason it was built for real is because we burned it down in the movie. So another one of my disasters. Uh, Jimmy Reardon, I got to do the Chicago L in 1962. So we, e we even got the oldest train out of stock and brought it up on the track. Chicago was wonderful. They let us do whatever we wanted to. We even cut a hole through the ties so we could get this shot looking down at the bottom there. And they were, they were happy with it as long as we put the ties back together when we left. You know. Here's an example of the kinds of things you get to do as an art director. All the timber that you see there and all the rock is actually carved foam with a hard plastic coat painted over it and then uh, very talented painters doing a great paint job on it. But this was a fun movie. Uh, you know, uh, Christopher Reeve is in there. Uh, uh, and, and anyway, it was John Ritter. It was great fun to do that. This is when I graduated to the big time. I ended up working for Universal as the head of their design for their theme parks and their, and their studios. So this is, this is a rendering for the first one we did in Florida, in Orlando, Florida. I worked with a company that only did architectural renderings in Akron, Ohio. And, and they had 24 people doing this painting. They did it in two weeks. They, they worked in two 12-hour shifts, 12 in a day and 12 at night. There were specialists that did trees, specialists who did people, specialists who did cars, specialists who did shadows. <laughs> and I brought them 100 photographs of all around the lot at Universal in Los Angeles for, so they could fill the environment with, uh, with real honest to God movie making going on there. But this is the kind of stuff we did in that park. This is New York Street. And there, there's New York Street in the background and the, uh, New York Harbor in the foreground. This is during construction. And those are several of the art directors I worked with on the project. And this is, a, this is an example of kind of thing that, that really gave me a great uh, foundation here at Notre Dame that I applied. This is all perspective painting that's in the back. The buildings in the center and the back are all on flat walls that are cut out to match the painting. So the, the New York Public Library that you see there is 60 feet tall. The buildings in the background, the, the Polish consulate building on the right the green roof one is, uh, that's 90 feet tall actually. So, so there's, and the Guggenheim is flat. And so you, people would walk and look up the front of it because they couldn't believe that that round thing was flat. That's the talent of the scenic painters. Here's some painting tricks where the bottom part is a set in Hollywood Boulevard. Uh, this is supposed to be Hollywood Boulevard and the, and the bottom part below is supposed to be New York. 
there's a piece of aluminum 20 feet out from the camera stand where you would put your camera down. It was shaped to fit the buildings in the distance on the bottom and cut out so you could see the floor of the sky at the top. So those are, those in the movie industry, those are called glass shots and they're very rare. So, but we put them in because it was a way for the guests at the park to get involved in the movies and do that. We did drawings for everything. Drawings like this for Beverly Hills, for San Francisco. Here's some of the attractions that we had. Doug Trumbull did the movie in Back to the Future. It was the first time that anybody had ever done a motion control camera movie with an Omnimax camera. And his dad, who was a famous camera engineer, designed a, a carbon-based boom to hold the camera that had never been used before. So I got the, an opportunity to still work in the film industry. At that exhibit, we had a place where you could go in and see how movies were made using samples from Alfred Hitchcock's movies. So there was a movie he did in... Uh, 1941, came out in 42, it was called Saboteur. And there was a scene in there with the Statue of Liberty where a guy falls off. So to demonstrate how you could do that, the guests got a chance to look like they were falling off. I sent my art directors over to a research library to get pictures and drawings of the Statue of Liberty so we could do this set that you see on the right there. And they came back with this drawing that my dad had done in 1941. So he was a graduate from here in 1934 and, and again in 36 for a master's. And he worked on the movie and he did this drawing and we used it to build a torch in Florida years later. Another big theme park, Islands of Adventure in the foreground, you can see the studio behind. So all that property there was my, my bailiwick for a while. This is the kind of stuff we did at the, at the uh, um, Islands of Adventure, port of entry, exotic sets. This is a superhero island where we had the Spider-Man ride and all kinds of, and the Hulk ride and things like this. That's Stan Lee in there, who's the famous comic book artist that developed all these creatures over the years. So he was there on opening day to, to welcome them. Got to work on another exotic piece was Dr. Seuss's Land. Got to work with um, Steven Spielberg's T-Rex. And then we went on to do the whole thing over again in Japan and Osaka. Which I was the vice president of the operation then. So there's a billion dollars worth of work there, including the hotels in the background at the top. And, and working with Japanese contractors with, and Japanese uh, craftsmen who are just absolutely amazing doing that. This is the uh, Rodeo Drive there. This is Hollywood Boulevard there. This is uh, Amity Village there. And here we are in New York again, and we did the same backing trick. This photo shows you a little bit better what all that looks like. But this is all done from a one-point perspective, and, and it's the most predominant spot for the guests walking in. And then here's me. Uh, on the upper right in the yellow shirt, I am uh, immortalized on a mural inside the Brown Derby restaurant in Japan. So that, that's me. And, and then down below, my initials are on a 1963 or 62 Chevy at Mel's Drive-In. So... I managed to leave my name behind there. After I got back to the States, I had been 14 years in the theme park bit, and I really was sort of, uh, I, was, I was, as they say, I couldn't get arrested. So I started back at the bottom again. And so this is the first thing I did. I worked on the Hulk, and I did these drawings for a Berkeley neighborhood. And then I got promoted to art director right away and went back up. And then I dropped into the specialty of motion capture, and I would do sketches like this hand-drawn sketches that would eventually co go into three-dimensional uh, digital sets like this in the background. I got to be Tom Hanks' teacher on this. So Tom was a conductor on this movie, and, and he was also, he, he played six parts, Santa Claus and, and the little kid, the little kid that you see standing in the front there, he played that part too. And, and the little kid helps drive the train. So I had to teach Tom how to drive a locomotive, which... I could do because my grandfather and my uncle, who were both engineers in the Chicago Burlington Railroad, had taught me how to drive a train when I was a kid. You know, took me to the local park where they had trains on display and took me up in the cab and showed me what levers to pull and what gauges to watch and all that. So I could tell Tom how to drive a, a train. So at, at, the, at this point in my life, I was doing some drawings like this, and then I was working in motion capture mostly. Where my, the most important part of my job was helping the actors understand where they were in this capture space where you couldn't see the set. And I had to show them what the set looked like and tell them how to behave with the furniture and things like that. So I would do sketches like this as a concept of where we were headed 
but then it would eventually, these amazing computer artists would eventually build a set that looked like that. And then we'd put the actors in by this method of motion capture. And then I did a real movie for a little while. This is a set I did for Steven on uh, the back lot at Universal, a crashed 747, destroyed New Jersey neighborhood in the background. That was a lot of fun, we did that. I, w I did these drawings for a movie that I didn't get to work on. They did it a year later without me, you know, so I, this is all I did for that. Got to work on Avatar, uh, which was quite an experience, but it had a huge art department. We had 100 people in it in Los Angeles and probably another 40 or 50 in New Zealand. And then the computer uh, part of it was uh, another 150 people. So when you... My credit at the end of this movie, I'm just in a cloud of names as opposed to having my name all by itself on the movie. <laughs> but it was, a, it was fun working on the movie because of the talent around, around me. It was awful working with Jim Cameron, who is the director, because he's a genius and he can't understand how any of us could be so stupid and he berates us all day long because we just don't know what the hell we're doing. So it was, it was very, very difficult, but some of the best talent I ever worked with are on it, so I had a great time. And this is the kind of thing we did where the, all those little ramps that everybody's walking on there and eventually ends up in the movie. You see them running along a tree branch on this planet six light years away. And I, I would still, still do hand-on stuff where I would show them how to put together a blue screen set. But that the artwork that you actually see and the, what goes into the movie was done by these amazing artists that I couldn't match their capability, but I could look over their shoulder and tell them they were doing a good job and they let me say I was supervising them. Yeah. Yeah. I worked on uh, Christmas Carol. These are two movies I worked on that didn't get made. Uh, Philippe Petit is the guy who walked between the two towers on a tightrope where he stole his way up there late at night just before the building was completed. There's only 36 photographs of him doing it. And this is one of them. And uh, we were going to make a movie where we actually made you feel like you were there with him going across the wire. And the picture on the lower left is actually him on our soundstage in Culver City. And that's really Philippe Petit doing the walk the same way he did it. We motion captured it. Much later, uh, they did the movie in blue screen with a whole different crew, so I wasn't involved. We also worked on a remake of Yellow Submarine, and it never got beyond this rehearsal day. Basically, the problem was that Disney wouldn't um, fund it anymore. They didn't. It was too much of a gamble for them. They thought they'd lose money on it, so we didn't get to make those movies. This is the last movie I worked on. This is my favorite picture of me in front of the painted backings in Florida. And this is my gang in front of the old architecture building at our 50th reunion. So there was actually seven of us here, one more who wasn't in the picture. He was off visiting somebody else at this time. And, and so uh, if you look on the very right, that's Tom Conley who's here. The next one to the left is John Gillen, he's here. Jim wasn't there, he was in Florida, his home in the Keys. So, so we missed out on that, but then I, through all of us in the back the way we were in 1964, inside the architecture building. And that's it. I hope we, <laughs> we're ready to move on to something else. <laughs> sure. All right, so I think everyone here enjoyed that immensely. That was great. Thank you so much for sharing all of that. Um, I'd like to start our conversation today, uh, beginning with your at the beginning of your Notre Dame journey. Mm -hmm. So your father, Bill, as you as has been noted, was a 1934 graduate, mm -hmm. and uh, I understand he was a contemporary of Frank Montana, who is a well known name here. Yeah, uh, back then uh, here at. Uh, at Notre Dame. Notre Dame was part of about a 22 or a 23 school group that, was, that uh, were using what they call the Beaux-Arts system of design. It was, and in the United States, it was headquartered in Manhattan. And, and they ran a design competition for all the schools that were in this method of teaching. And um, once every two months, I think they would send out a problem, a, pro a project, and it would, it would come out be published and sent to all the schools, and then the schools will look at it and they would decide who among the talented students there were going to get the chance to do the solution that would be better than anybody else's solution. It all ended up at a competition with a jury in New York City where they looked at the design solutions, and then 
they would award a prize from there, uh, a Beaux Arts prize, a like, big bronze medal, or, or sometimes it was even a cash prize, 50 bucks or, or 200 bucks, which is an amazing amount of money in the 30s. And, and my dad, uh, although we didn't, he didn't know it at the time, he was competing with Frank Montana. So if you look in the Beaux Arts magazine from that period, you see the designs for the solutions. One of the top contenders was always Frank Montana, and the other contender was my dad. You know, so, so he was, and when I was going to school here, I did not know that. I had no, we all liked working with Frank Montana. Because he was, he was your guy, professor while you were here. Pardon? He was your professor while he you was, were here. He, he was the dean of the department at the yeah. time. At, at, and uh, it, anyway, so. Th that connection was there with with him, and, and like a lot, there were a lot of things that I learned about Notre Dame after I left, and I wish I knew them ahead of time. Sure. So, so my only advice is uh, do all the research you can to find out, find out about Willoughby Edbrook who designed the the, the admin building and also worked on the, on the uh, Chicago World's Fair, the World Columbian Exhibition in 1893. Find out about these people. And find out about Ivan Mestrovic, the sculptor who, who has sculptures here, things like that. So be curious about what's going on here, and you'd be amazed what's going on here. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so going back to your dad for a second, architecture is certainly a family profession, and your brother, um, Nicholas, yeah. is an architectural illustrator, correct? He, yeah, he, uh, he primarily was an illustrator. Okay. Yeah. And, but but he, he's, uh, you know, he's a bona fide architect. He got his uh, bachelor from the uh, University of Arizona, uh, or excuse me, Arizona State University, and... Uh, he applied here, and his grades weren't good enough to get in. And when he ended up at a, I actually got him at ASU. He, he decided, oh well, college is not for me. I'm go, I'm going to go to Europe with my buddies from high school. So they went to Europe, and I was it, it irritated me. That he was seven years younger than me. It irritated me that he wasn't being more responsible. So I applied to four colleges for him, even ri even writing a letters about why he wanted to be an architect. <laughs> Got him into ASU, and he ended up being their top student. He was, you know, he was meant to be an architect, and he shined the minute he stepped into it. So he forgave you for doing the applications. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I completely forgot about it. About ten years ago, I was visiting with him, and we were talking, and he said, "Do you remember that you got me into school?" And I, I didn't. You know, I was in all. <laughs> so. so, do you feel like your dad's career path as an architect, and then working in movies? Is is a major influence on what led you into it? Yeah, but it was it was very subliminal thing. I I, um, I was imbued with filmmaking from my dad from design. He would bring blueprints home of sets he was working on, and and it was always something the little boy would be interested in. You know, it was a, it was a saloon and a western set, or it was a train or a, a steamboat or or whatever. It was something that. A pirate ship one time, and and uh, and I would pin these drawings up on my wall in my bedroom and study them and ask them questions. You know, what does this mean? Why is that there? And I was just curious about it. And of course, I was amazed at this man that worked in movies. You know, and so <laughs> I was paying a lot of attention to what went on. But I never thought that that's where I was headed. And the same thing happened to him. He he went to Southern California from from Notre Dame with the idea that he was going to work for architects there. He got a job in Pasadena. And both of us um, had friends who were working in the film industry, and they said they're looking for recent architectural graduates in the art department that are talented and can draw fast and know what they're doing. You ought to go talk to them. So my dad went and talked to him at Universal Studios, where his, uh, one of his classmates from here was a writer there, and his wife was working in the art department as a secretary, and she said, Bill, you better go over and talk to those guys. And he walked in, and they just snapped him up, and he was immediately their favorite guy. And he went on and had a great career from there. And I sort of did the same thing. I was going to be an architect. I wasn't really interested in going into film work. After my freshman year here, my dad got me a summer job running the blueprint machine in an art department and being a runner, an office runner. And I went into every part of the studio in that job and saw how things were done, but that still wasn't what I was going to do. And when I got out, there was a recession going on in the country, and there was no construction going on in Los Angeles at all. And the architecture offices were mostly empty, and I couldn't get a job anywhere. So I went back to the studio where I had friends who worked at night 
for themselves. They, they moonlighted doing working drawings for tract homes. They would get 250 bucks per set of drawings for a house in the San Fernando Valley in Los Angeles. So I went to see them to see if they had some work they could throw my way. Walked in the door, the head of the arch department walked by and says, what are you doing here? And I say, I came in to talk to the guys about some work. And he said, well, come upstairs. And I said, well, wait a minute. And, and he said, the guy behind him was the assistant. His name was Eddie Elliott. Eddie says, shh. <laughs> so I went upstairs. And, and Alex says, can you start tomorrow? And I said, well, yeah, but I don't know if I know how to do this stuff. And he says, don't worry about it. So and I found out that what I learned here was the best basis for what I was going to do there. And with, I got promoted after two weeks. I went from a junior to a senior set designer after two weeks. And it just went on from there. And I found out I got paid twice as much as I did in architecture. So why the hell not stay there? <laughs> <laughs> so certainly career paths aren't always what we intend or plan. No, no. But, but once, once you're in it, in a situation like that, you begin to think you were always there, you know, and, and it just becomes part of you. And for me, it got better uh, because I got into the part where I was doing all the design work with architects on the theme parks. So I was, I was really getting back more into architecture and, uh, and whatever, whatever you do to make people enjoy an environment and, and have a story be put upon them so they can enjoy it in theme parks is really the same in architecture. You know, however you go into a building and, and use it the way it's been meant to be used to do whatever you need to do and have a good life there. Same thing as making a movie set that tells a story. You know? so, so it was very, very much the same as architecture. You know? If you had gotten to choose and follow your intended plan, what kind of architecture would you have gone into? What were you hoping to work on? Pardon? What were you hoping to work on when I don't you were a know. student? I, um, I, I had two jobs, which today are an embarrassment, uh, or three jobs, actually. Um, one of them was, uh, there was a fellow here in our class named Chuck Weiler. He's, he works in New Jersey now. He's an architect. that's pretty good. And um, Chuck left here and went to Philadelphia and was working in a very large architectural firm, and they loved him. You know, they loved everything he was doing. And... Uh, they said, is there anybody back at Notre Dame still that you can talk into coming here? Because they wanted more of the same. So I happened to be walking by the payphone in the basement of the Bond Hall when it rang. And I picked it up. <laughs> and Chuck says, what are you doing? He said, you want to come to Philadelphia and work in a, a really great firm? And I said, sure. So the, I was there, I don't know, a couple of days later. And uh, the project I worked on was taking this fabulous... Victorian Gothic building in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, that was the headquarters for the school district. And I was putting drop ceilings, modern ceilings like this, drop ceilings into the Victorian rooms so there was less space to air condition, and putting, taking the beautiful six panel oak doors that were seven and a half feet tall out of their frames and putting in blank steel doors so they were fireproof. And I was basically destroying the architecture. But that's what was going on in the country at the time, is everything was modern and slick and clean. And if you could put a screen in front of a brownstone in Brooklyn that was a simple aluminum screen, that made it really cool. And so in South Bend, the fronts of some of the biggest buildings and the department stores were all modernized by blanking out the classic architecture that was on them. And so I did that. And... and uh, uh, now, fortunately, all those buildings are being restored back to the way they're supposed to be. But the other thing, I worked for a very small architect who was a plan checker at a big firm, and he had his own little place that he worked on at nighttime. And I worked for him, and he was a terrible draftsman. And he was so bad that his drawings were inaccurate. So I was in the position of, when I was detailing for him, of trying to correct the errors that were in the building. Sometimes from one end of the building to the other, it'd be six inches off in elevation, because he would kind of lazily pull his pencil across on the parallel rule and make the line climb as it went across. So I had this very difficult time trying to convince him that there was a problem here, that something was wrong. <laughs> and when I finally convinced him, he would say, oh, we can fix that. He would do something like take the bottom shelf in a kitchen and clip it at a 45 degree angle so there was headroom and a staircase going up. Yeah. So, you know, so there was nothing that I was proud of that I was working on. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> and then I fell into movies and, and you do that kind of stuff on purpose because nobody knows it, only the camera sees it. <laughs> so you mentioned being in the basement of Bond Hall answering the phone. Uh -huh. um, you have something in common with our current students in that you moved buildings while you were a student. Yeah, yeah. And um, you moved from what we, now, we know as Crowley into oh. Bond Hall. And what was it like to move um, into Bond? Well, it, for me personally, it was um, it was a kind of a disaster. Uh, <laughs> but I'll I'll get to that later. But being in the building was really exciting. It was interesting, and uh, the, the, at that time, it it didn't look like it does now. So at, at at that time, it was still closer to the library it originally was, and the floor that we were on, the thesis students were in the basement, and all the cast iron posts that came down for the stacks, which were, I forget, three feet apart and four feet apart in every direction. They cut out four of them or three of them out of a group and they would make the larger rectangle, the room that we were in, the, the partitioned space that we were in. But just, we could reach up and top, touch the next horizontal piece that had the floor and the next part of the stacks in it. So, I mean, we put, solid core doors up there and slept up there. We, you know, it, it was a very comfortable place to be. The, the main floor, it was like a sweets catalog. All the columns and everything were coated with bricks with all the different patterns you could use and laying bricks and limestone. This is all material that was donated by local companies so they could have a, you know, they could refinish the interior, turning the stacks into a big lobby. It's where the library is now and in that building. And, uh, uh, it, so it was fascinating to go through and see all the things that, that basically Montana and Schultz and his people had put together to, at the uh, most economical way to make work as, a, as an architecture building. We liked it. My problem was I was not uh, a, a hard studying good student. And at the beginning of that year, our two crits that were responsible, two cr critiques that were responsible for us were doing a national competition. And they were only making brief appearances at the school, expecting us to behave like grown-ups and be responsible and do our work. And I unfortunately took the opportunity to be lazy. And so towards the end of that time, I was in this building where I didn't want to be because I was not doing my work the way I should be doing. <laughs> and I actually, uh, I flunked physics in my freshman year, or not physics, or calculus, and I took it over. And, uh, and from then on, I was missing three credit units. I was behind. And so I, somewhere in the middle, I didn't take freshman philosophy or sophomore philosophy because it, to me, it wasn't that important a subject. And I didn't deal with it until my last. So 10 semesters, at my 10th semester, I realized I still owe three units in philosophy. And the only class I could fit in my schedule was a philosophy majors class. And I was still lazy in some ways. You know, if it was about design, I loved it and I worked hard. But you know, other stuff, I didn't really work at it. So I didn't actually, uh, I failed the philosophy class in my last semester. So I didn't graduate with my buddies. And my dad came. It was his first time back at Notre Dame in however many 30-some years he was there because that was the only time he could fit into his schedule. So he was there watching my friends graduate when I wasn't graduating. <laughs> and, and I was absolutely miserable. But what happened is I ended up here taking philosophy in summer school, which was a fabulous experience. And there were half a dozen other guys in my class, like 40% of them, they were in the same spot. For some reason or other, they were behind one, one unit, you know, one, one class. So they were all there with me that summer. One of them was a guy that loved mathematics and started out in mathematics and decided he was going to be in music and he went into music. And then he decided architecture was the way to go and he went into architecture. So he'd been there about, I don't know, six years, had enough credits almost in three things to get a degree, but not enough to make it out. So, <laughs> so he, he ended up taking calculus again uh, because he loved math and he took the only calculus class he could fit in to, to match the requirement was one that was up for math majors that he thought that would be cool, he'd love it, but it was too much work. And so by the end of the semester, he said, I'm in trouble, I can't, I can't do the exam. And so he, he went to Chicago and did it. He graduated, we all graduated in that class, but it, we actually graduated in August, not in June. And, and uh, 
the, the only wonderful thing about it was that we were not out on the lawn on the main quad sitting in the sun in our blue gowns and caps, sweating it out. We were all the, the smaller group that graduated in August, which was mostly nuns and priests who were here taking teaching classes in their summer vacation. The, we graduated from the grotto underneath all those elms and a, you know, in the shade. And instead of having the Dean of Architecture hand me my diploma, the president of the university, the famous Father Hesburg, actually handed me my diploma, shook my hand and said, good luck. Yeah. <laughs> so that, that made up for all the horrible mistakes I made. <laughs> and I was hoping to use your story as a cautionary tale for some of our students. <laughs> no, Father Hesburgh is not only not here, but you, the President University will not give your yeah. diploma at the Grotto if you graduate in August. So I don't know how much attention they're paying to you right now if you're in the thesis class in this new building. But my, my advice to you is be a grown-up and take responsibility for what you're doing, <laughs> and you'll be all right. <laughs> As one of the undergraduate advisors, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so going back to Bond for a second, you had a chance to visit us last fall um, yes. in Bond. And um, what was your impression of how architecture is taught now and how that might be different from how it was being taught when you were here? Well, I don't know whether I have it as a myth or not, but I feel like it's the same. You know, it's, it's uh, the approach that Notre Dame is taking these days where there's a, a, a deep interest in the classic art and classic architecture and form and not only in the decorative stuff that you see or the elements of the building, but in the spaces themselves and how they lay out and how, how you use them. Uh, I'm, I've grown to like that. When I first heard about it and we first saw the, the preliminary designs for these buildings, and, I was not a fan of Simpson. You know, I, I thought of him as a one-trick pony, that all he knew how to do was this classic Roman stuff, you know. And I didn't think that was appropriate for here. Uh, and my classmates all agreed, and we groused about it in emails back and forth. <laughs> but I've become a convert. I really like the place. I think it's really well done. And part of it, part of what makes me like it is it's not quite as flamboyant as the original concept sketches. There's not as many elements that seem to be just for the, the fact that we're going to exhibit some classic architecture, not as much of that. And things that were done to integrate it into the campus, like using the two different color bricks that are all over the campus, the, the tan color and the red color brick that's Notre Dame brick, using that on the outside. And also in my career in the film industry, where I've used classic architecture a lot in the sets, and I've, I've come to appreciate it. And, a lot of the stuff that we did in the theme park business had to do with hotels and things like that. And we made an el a hotel elegant by giving it the kinds of detailing that you see in the Morris Inn. So the Morris Inn has been all really well done, but it's got classic OG moldings and bullexion molds and proper proportions and finishes. And uh, that's uh, an idea of an elegant uh, building that's a hotel. And I sort of grew into it, and I liked it. You could look at the hotel that's across the street here, uh, the Hilton Garden Inn, and it's an, another example of fine architecture. This one, but it is clean and streamlined on the inside. It's not. It's more like what we studied, the Skidmore's and Merrill and the Mies van der Rohe when we were here. It's more like that on the inside. On the outside, it sort of emulates classic architecture, but it's not. Um, it's um, more simplified and abstract and not as heavily detailed. So I look at that and I say, well, that's some contemporary guy trying to tell you that he knows a lot about uh, classic architecture, but he doesn't. You know, go over there, look inside the Morrison, and you'll see it. Look at a Ritz Carlton hotel. Ritz Carlton is all that way. So I've, I've grown to the point where I love that look, and that's what this building has, except where you're working and it's as plain as it can be because it's up to you to figure out how things should be once you're inside this building. <laughs> so you referenced a few times while we've been chatting and during your presentation earlier um, that things like perspective drawing and um, some of your the detailing you learned um, was really important in your career as a set designer. I'm curious um, if you have more things that you found really critical that um, your architecture um, 
architecture background helped you to do? And are there some things that you think our students should be cultivating if this was an interest of theirs, um, a career interest for them? I, I think so. Um, they, today, if you go into the film industry and you see designers coming in from theater design in New York, and now you can actually take courses in production design in colleges. There was no such thing when, when, uh, when I started out. What, what you needed to learn, you learned on the job. Uh, different than whatever the architecture was. So you see more of that. So there are people that are getting by really well in the film industry without an architecture background, the designers. But um, for me, when I, especially in a special effects shot where we had to blend the perspective of a painting into the perspective of our set and the atmosphere and the air of the whatever we photographed, that had to be in the painting too or it wouldn't look right. You know, Learning to understand that was all based on on my understanding of perspective and how it was put together and uh, color and all these sorts of things, they all applied. And if you learned them well here, that you're, you were walking in with the tools that you needed just to add the film associated things with it. And you ended up being someone that they really wanted because they saw right away that you understood what was going on and they didn't have to do a lot of talking to you. You saw that one little sketch of a San Francisco apartment with a round San Francisco turret window area and things like that. All George Webb had to do as a production designer that would say, here, do that and walk away because he knew I knew all the rest of it and I was gonna put it together the way it should be. And I would understand what was peculiar to the architecture in San Francisco that would be different from anywhere else. So it would fit in the movie, you know. And I learned all that here, you know, and, and, uh, and all I did was grow that as I worked in the film industry. Uh, and it was the same for my dad. You know, both of us uh, were ingrained with architectural history, even though we're, in my generation, we weren't really happy with our professor, but, but I was exposed to all of it. And uh, working in the film industry, it just, it helped you, you immediately recognize what was supposed to happen. This Arts building that's supposed to be in Chicago or New York, you knew what it was supposed to be and you could put it in there. And if you had to cheat to make, make it fit into the shot, um, you knew why you were doing it and you could make it so the audience wouldn't notice that you did it. And, and it was all based on your understanding of not only the textures and the details of design, but the space itself, the architectural space, and how it was gonna be used. And for us, it was how the actors are gonna perform in it. And the, how you're going to be able to tell the story in that space. And I learned it all here. And, and uh, people can work in the film industry and learn it without having an architectural background. But my dad and I were set up so that we were the stars in our group because we had a basis from here. And uh, it, it's just, you know, when you're that age, you're kind of dumb and you don't know it. It just sort of happened for me. And then later on, when I look back, I realized the reason I was having such a great time is because I knew more about what I was doing than most people did. You know, it was going, I got it from here. <laughs> so I had a chance, happily, to um, watch That Touch of Mink recently with <laughs> Cary Grant and Doris Day. And you, you showed us a set from that in your mm -hmm. presentation earlier. Um, and you went from that to coining the phrase space wrangler in working with digital um, productions yeah. like Avatar. Um, what skills do you think have remained constant? Is, is drawing still well, um, valid? Or is that just you? Is it something is, that's, that's um, important throughout uh, the, per, let me through the profession? Let me put it this way. Um, Everything that you know how to do in a watercolor rendering, everything you know how to do in a pencil or an ink drawing, applies to everything you do on computers. So the best artists at renderings that tell you what the scene is uh, are do, using their skill. You know, so they learn how to paint in art school, and they learn how to make a scene in a movie and how to paint a scene that told the story that the director would buy into that the studio would buy into so they would fund the movie. All of that is a skill that was learned the way uh, all of us learned to start off with. And then how well you translated it into computer use was the next step. So in reality, all you were learning is you were learning the programs and learning how to be facile in those programs. But the basis of your work was from whatever your original teaching was. Now today, most architectural schools today, you don't see parallel rules and T-squares and triangles and things like that. Most people start on the computer now. 
and they never really have the opportunity. But the best people I worked with had started out as painters or draftsmen and then learned the skill on a computer. And I was in the, in the beginning of the computer work in the entertainment industry. It was, it was when I was working in um, uh, the theme park area. and We were actually working with architects and, and we required that they do um, digital drawings so that we could have a record that, that, would, that would never deteriorate, that would always be there. Although we found out that's not true either. <laughs> Even though you have them on a hard drive, they do deteriorate. But, but um, uh, I, I learned that, that I didn't like it at first because there was no soul in the drawings. But people have learned how to put whatever the design requirement beyond the drawing is. They've learned how to put that in. And now people will overlay Photoshop on top of AutoCAD and you know, give it the character you need for a motion picture set. And, and, uh, and now an awful lot of stuff is done in 3D. It's done in Rhino or Maya. And, and uh, they're difficult programs to learn and to become facile in. But once you're there, you can do more than anybody else. And if you have a good artistic background, this becomes a new tool that you can deliver these great drawings. One of the other things that you learn in the film industry is that uh, uh, you, you learn what the lens can see in a camera. You know, what, what, the, what your format is, if it's widescreen, 1 to 185 proportion, or 1 to 2.31, or whatever. The, the, uh, uh, you, once you have that, once you have the focal length of the lens, you know exactly what it's going to see. So you can plan ahead of time. You can tell a director, we're going to build a set that looks like this, and this painting shows you what you'll see on your camera using your favorite 35 millimeter lens or whatever it is. And, and physics actually tells you that. Optics and physics tells you that. So if you have that in your schooling, when it comes to your time to say, all right, from now on I have to tell you what you're going to see in a camera before you believe me, you learn it very quickly if, you ha if you've had it in school. Some people never got it. I worked with cameramen that never got it, that, that, that really didn't understand the optics of physics, the physics of op optics, and, and that didn't know perspective. I, I worked with a cameraman that didn't understand that wherever you are, the horizon is. You know, so, so, so I, I told him, you know, we were working on Best Little Horror House in Texas, uh, and uh, the, Bill Fraker was the name of the cinematographer. And, and I said, okay, we're going to be on the sixth floor of this television station in um, Houston and, uh, for this set. And there's going to be a window so people will know that they're in Texas. So is, do you want it to be the sixth floor? Or do you want to be on the first floor? Uh, and he said, well, it doesn't make any difference. So it's always the same. And I said, no, no that's not right. And I, I said, you know, and I hadn't learned... To, to, to be less subtle, you know. And so I said, no, that's wrong. I said, well, immediately, he, uh, uh, cameramen are always right. And production designers never are, you know. So, so that, that, that shut down the conversation. So I went to a building in Texas where we were scouting locations, and I went, there was a, like, I think it was a hotel that had a, a window looking out in the same direction on 11 floors. So I went and I took a picture out of each one, holding the camera, <laughs> and I said, see, the horizon comes up with you. So with our backing has to reflect that wherever you are. And, and, I, and I, I said, so you see, you see farther, but the horizon is always there. You see more stuff, and it's in smaller scale because you're higher up, but the horizon's right there. And he says, oh, you were tilting your camera down all the time. Yeah? <laughs> yeah, and I, I couldn't make him believe it. And, and we had a backing. We, we had a, the, the whorehouse was... It was on a stage, largest stage at Universal. We had a 360 degree backing of Texas all the way around. And when we were on the second floor of the whorehouse looking out, in the back of it, we actually had a second backing that was reefed up on the floor. And we'd pull it up, and we had the horizon and everything you saw from the second floor in the proper position. And he didn't want to use it. And his excuse was it's too bright. You know, it, it looks phony. And, and uh, so I said, well, I can. Uh, uh, I said we could hang a scrim, which is what the grips do. They put they put up a, a nylon netting, and they can they can pound light on it from the back, and it makes it less transparent. And so you can the image of the painting softens up. It's like there's uh, a, an atmosphere like there is today outside with a lot of moisture in the air. 
it thickens the air and it makes it harder to see in the distance. I said, so we can put up a scrim. And, and the key grip said to me, I'm sorry. He said, we're working with Bill Fraker. He never uses scrims, so we don't have one. So I said, okay, here's the last thing we can do. I'll get a painter to come in here, put blue gray paint in his sprayer, and he can dust it, you know, which now destroys the backing and it won't be rentable, you know. So I, I said, he can dust it. And then we'll look at it, and if you like it, we'll shoot it. If, you, if it's not enough, we'll dust it again, you know. So we finally dusted it with enough blue gray paint that it softened it up. And he says, okay, but you won't like it. It won't be in the movie, you know, the shot. It was in the movie. And it, the only time you looked out a window in that movie and saw something, even on location, the only time you ever saw something was that shot. <laughs> and then we had a second unit cameraman that came in to do all the dance numbers after the main photography was done. Everything in his shot, you could see out the windows and you could see Texas. You know, so, but everything else, if you see the movie, and you probably won't pay attention because there's all the girls in their underwear in the foreground, but, but uh, if you look out the window, it's blown out like as the exposure was too much. It was too bright. You can't see. It's just too bright when you look in. And, and uh, Bill Faker started out as a portrait photographer. And his, one of the reasons he was so successful is nobody did a better job at lighting the movie stars than he did. So the stars wanted him. You know? they, they always looked beautiful. And, and so that's why he was on the movie. And he never cared about what was out the window. It was like being a still photographer and you can't control the light out there. So it just goes away. It's too bright. That's what all his shots in the movie look like. But once again, nobody complained because nobody was looking out the window in the movie. <laughs> so, so. Anyway, you have experiences like that. And most of your understanding of it and how you try and make it work is based on your grounding and your very early learning. And this is the place where I got it. So in your work um, with films and television, Universal Studios, whether you're um, trying to do a backdrop of Texas or trying to build Brooklyn, um, you sometimes mm -hmm. have a basis in reality, right? Something to reference readily for you. Mm -hmm. um, but when you're dealing with a, another world, right? An imaginary world like Avatar. Oh, yeah. Um, how do you begin with a totally blank slate? What does that process look like? Well, um, I, one of my friends who is a production designer on Avatar, his name is Rick Carter. He's a, he has an Academy Award for, for that and for, uh, for um, Lincoln. I don't try to remember his brother. So he's, he's all parts of the spectrum too. One of the things he said one time about our profession that I've always retained is, he said, we are the people that can look where there is nothing and see something. You know, so, <laughs> so that's basically in places like Avatar or some other futuristic place or any superhero movie or where you're inventing the environment, you have the ability to see something, but you're not doing it by yourself. So the, you're doing it for the director and for the producer, and you have to sell them before you build a set. And, and uh, so you have plenty of practice trying different things and seeing what, they're, what the director's been thinking about. Basically, it's a director's dream. It's what he's going to do. So you're trying to find something that makes him happy. On Avatar, you were working with Jim Cameron, who is a genius, and he can draw better than me. And, and none of us were smart enough to know the hell what we were doing. It was a really difficult time because he was the only person that could see what was there. You know? mm -hmm. So we would work with him every day and be berated because we got it wrong. But slowly, surely, we realized that Everything in the planet looks something like the things that grew in the bottom of the sea and something that grew in tropical forests in Southeast Asia and something from another movie like Wizard of Oz or something like that. You know, we, we eventually found it by a lot of hard labor, a lot of paintings, a lot of thinking, a lot of baloney theoretical talk. You know, we finally find it. Now, some people are, are geniuses in that era. So... The people that designed, say, the Star Wars environments, they, it was in their head. It was like they magically knew what had to be there. And uh, those guys were uh, amazing talent. Uh, Stuart Craig is another guy that I worked with on, on History of the World with Mel Brooks. He was from England. Stuart ended up being the production designer on all the Harry Potter movies. And he knew better than J.K. Rowling what... Harry Potter's school looked like, what Hogwarts looked like. And, and it was in his head better than anybody in the business. So 
basically all I had to do was tell his artist, do this, and then he'd hold it up to the director and they'd say, lovely, and J.K. <laughs> Rob- uh, J.K. Rowlings would say, oh, Stuart, you're so wonderful, you know exactly what I was thinking. You know? so, so there are geniuses that walk right in and say, this is what we should be doing, and everybody says, yes, that's the answer. Thank God someone knows what we should be doing. But I was in those kinds of positions, I was always the guy that was experimenting and trying to figure out. I did it on a low budget movie. It was a TV movie called The Aliens Are Coming. And I had to do the inside of an alien spaceship. And by that time, the movie Aliens had been done and Star Wars had been done. So my commission from the producer and the director was do something that doesn't look like it was in Star Wars and do something that doesn't look like it was an alien, you know. So I had to come up with something on a very low budget. And on Winter Kills, we had done a, b- a huge backing, 40 feet tall and 120 feet long, that looked like uh, Louise Nevelson's sculpture, abstract blacks and grays. And it was a background in a huge computer center where we'd, when the light fell off and things got confusing, there was this abstract sculpture that carried on. We didn't know what, but we were paying attention to the actors. So all we needed was this thing in the background. So we had it painted for that movie. And I thought, I'll get that. I'll hang it in a circle. And I'll do cutouts out of plywood all around like that, paint them some gaudy color. And then we'll do a deck that's supposed to be where you fly the spaceship, but has translucent plastic stuff, you know. (laughs) And, and, And then the aliens will have costumes on that have reflective beads like you see on a stop sign on them and we'll project dancing light on them while we're filming you know and there'll be this ethereal you know so so that was my solution to come up with something different that was out of out of this world and uh, the we walked on the stage and the director looked at me and he says it looks like a disco <laughs> <laughs> And, and the producer said, no, no, it looks more like a chapel, a modern chapel. <laughs> so I wasn't successful, but it was a TV show and nobody saw it, so I said, okay. <laughs> so that, that was my, su- my story for dreaming it up out of nothing. You know? <laughs> nice. So um, another job that you mentioned was your work um, at Universal Studios in Japan. Can you tell us a little bit more about your role there and, and what was that yeah, by, by that time, I'd grown to be the leader of the gang, you know. So uh, before that, I was what they called the executive art director and the design director. And that meant that I was sharing the design with the head architect and with the head engineer that was designing uh, the uh, machinery that went into the show's rides and with the head producer who was responsible for the shows. And the chairman of our division loved me and basically gave me carte blanche to do everything. You know, if he was unhappy with something, he'd say, I'm not, I'm not happy with the set that's in the ET ride. Can you go over there and show those guys what to do? So I got my nose into all of it, but it wasn't officially my job, but they made it my job, you know, and we were all comfortable with one another. So we just did it together. We did that. So by the time I got to Japan, which was the fourth theme park I did for Universal, uh, and by the way, we never called them theme parks. They were studio backlots because we were better than Disney. We weren't a theme park. You know, <laughs> Universal had a real genuine studio. That if you give me 60 bucks, I'll let you wander around in my sets and uh-huh. you know, have a great day. And I'll show you how movies are actually made. It's none of this phony Disney stuff. You know? So it was a whole different <laughs> philosophy. I wasn't allowed to say theme park. But anyway, by the time I got to Japan, uh, they officially made me in charge of everything. You know, so... So the, the difference was that now there were more people that I was looking over their shoulder and saying, you're doing a great job, keep it up. You know, so it, you, you really rely on the talent around you when you get When you're in, in a, an organization that's that big, all you can do is find things that are going wrong and kind of nudge them in the right direction. And basically by that point, you've learned who all the best talent is and you manage to hire them and, and you, what you're doing is making room for them to solve the problem. You know, so, so I, the concept in the very beginning, I'd sit there with a piece of paper with the chairman and we'd say, what about this? And that, that was the beginning. And then from there on, most of the design was done by everybody else. And I was just pushing it in the right direction. In Japan, they have these uh, huge festivals that are religious based, Shinto or Buddhist, and they have rolling shrines that are made out of timber and they're 40 feet tall. And, and there's a 
a group of monks on top ringing chimes, drums, and there's uh, uh, great uh, banners hanging down on the side, and there's teams of people in medieval costume pulling them by rope, huge six foot diameter wooden wheels. So they're rolling temples that are going along in parades in these festivals. And they, they don't have uh, a, a front axle that's on a pintle. It doesn't steer. So the thing can't be steered. It only goes in one direction. And it's being towed by 100 people, you know, uh, silk, I mean, uh, um, satin ropes, you know, being pulled. And um, so as they get ready to turn, they throw strips of bamboo on the street in front of it. And uh, the, everybody pulls with the ropes toward the direction they're going to go, and they slip on the bamboo going around. And there's one guy with a great big wooden wedge with a long handle on it who stands at the front of the wheel and pushes it in front of the wheel and lifts it up and makes the wheel go that direction. And I was able to tell my friends in Japan, the contractors, everybody said, that's my job. I'm the guy that makes the <laughs> wheel go that way and you guys go that way. He said, but you have to make it go that way. I'm just telling you, go that way with this wedge. That's all I'm doing. So it was the perfect thing to tell them, you know, that I'm very happy with the work you're doing, but I think if you nudge it this way a little better, We'll be fine, you know. So that's how. That's why I became the guy in charge. But that's what I did, you know. <laughs> so. Nudging the project. <laughs> so. um, I know there's going to be some questions out here. I'd like to ask one more before we open um, mm -hmm. to Q and A. Um, we talk a lot about in this school how to adapt our process and our approach to design to different cultures. And I'm curious, in working in Japan versus, say, working in Southern California. Um, how did a cultural shift impact your design work? Not only the outcome, but maybe the process too. Yeah, but basically, uh, if your job is to make this thing that's going to work in a certain way and entertain people and look great, uh, that talent that you have is basically the same everywhere. And in Japan, they have very large construction companies, and we had four working for us building our park there. And, excuse me, not part our studio there, and and um, they within their organization. So it's typical in Japan, the architects are part of the construction organization. So the big contracting companies they have a division that's architecture, but they behave just like the architects here are probably in Europe, you know, in places like that. And you're relying on their talent to understand a design and do the drawings that you're going to build from and do that, and they have suggestions about the way to make it better. The only difficulty that we had, that we Americans had there, was Japanese do their buildings differently. And uh, they would never, if this, if this was a plaster wall on the outside of a building, this is the way they'd want to do it, where they actually had joints in it every so often. Our sound stages are just one big stucco wall with no, and they don't like that because there's a lot of earthquakes there, and they're going to get cracks in the wall, and that's very bad. They don't like having a building with cracks in the wall. So they don't want to do the building the way you know, we want it to look like an American building. And it, when it covered a lot of things. Like uh, we had a, uh, a, an Irish bar in New York in our um, place there, and it had a pressed tin ceiling. So I don't know if you know what a pressed tin ceiling is, but it was very popular in the 19th century. And it, they, they take a four by eight sheet of tin, they put it in this huge cast iron stamper, and it stamps a pattern on them. It's usually squares with some kind of classic decoration molding in them and, and things like that. So they, they'll, they'll slam that piece of steel and they get it, and now they stick it on the ceiling, and it has a lip that'll pass it into the next one, and you end up with a ceiling that's all these modular pieces of, of it's supposed to look like plaster, but it's actually stamped tin. But it's actually a com uh, company in, New Jersey that still makes those and still makes them in the same cast iron stamp. And there's a catalog, you can, you know, architectural catalog, you can go there. I want from the WF Norman Company in New Jersey, in Las Vegas, New Jersey, you ever heard of that, that, uh, that makes these things. And I can buy them and I can stick them on the ceiling of my place and it can look like an Irish bar in New York City. It has imperfections in it because it's just stamped metal and it's very much 19th century, but that's the character. That's what you want. The Japanese look at that and 
Japanese have a way of when they don't approve of what you're doing, they never tell you no. They never say they're not going to do that. You know, they say, we'll do our best. But when they look at it and they're not happy, they go, <laughs> and they, they suck air through their teeth. You know, so we say, so we want you to use this stuff on the ceiling of the bar just like we did in Florida, and this is, this is how it looked down there, and we think it's great. You know, they, they were, so they, they said, we will do our best to do that for you. So I, I get a call from the architect in that area and the art director, and they come out to me and they said, the Japanese are not doing what we told them to do. So I go down there. They had a perfect rendition of this architectural shape, a perfect rendition of it that they had carved in clay and made a fiberglass mold and cast a fiberglass, and they were putting the fiberglass up, and it was perfect. You know, and, it, and it didn't have the character of this cattywampus not quite there, carefully crimped together how best you can, that is the character of these kinds of places, you know, the real places in America. So I would have to say to them, and we get up on the scaffolding and I, they all sit around me, every meeting with the construction people involved, usually 20 of them and 12 of us, and it was, uh, and the, the old, oldest guy had to sit in the middle, you know, and, and, and be respected. And then I would tell them, and I tell them the long story about why, why it was there. And the main thing is, it looks like an American place. All of your friends that come from Japan into Osaka to walk into this place, they're coming here because they're going to walk into a place that looks like it's in New York. And your tendency to do things perfectly is not what we have in New York. It's not American. It'll be a Japanese place. And why would they care about coming into a Japanese place when they came to see an American place? So won't you please do me a favor? And if you're going to sculpt it and make it out of fiberglass, won't you make it imperfect like the real stuff? Okay. You know, they, they just they didn't believe me. You know? <laughs> but they would do it, and it would be perfect. Their craftsmen were very talented. You know? It would be exactly what we wanted. But we'd have to go through this every time before they would be convinced. And then they would stand there and watch me when I came in, and I'd say, ah, oh, it's lovely. And they would like, oh, my God, you know? Because they didn't believe that I really meant what I said, you know? Yeah. So that, that part of the culture of Japan was very hard to deal with. But we were real consistent, and we just stuck to it. And the, the, we finally sold them on the idea that we're not doing your beautiful Japan. We're doing our imperfect America. <laughs> and the reason there are moldings like this on our doors is because we can build them sloppy opening and we can square up a frame and then we can cover the gap with a piece of molding and that's the reason it's there and the reason it doesn't come to the edge of the jam is because it might not be perfect so we always set it back an eighth of an inch and you can allow for the error and, and you know they would build it like it was a piano it was perfect <laughs> and, said, and the reason we want it to look like this is because that's the way it is in america people may not know that but in their subconscious they feel like oh yeah this is the kind of thing i would see in the united states I said, that's what I'm trying to get you guys to do, is to, is to give us America here in Japan. So they, you know, and, and they're fabulous people and fabulous contractors, and they just did it after, after we convinced them. That it was, and there were dozens of things all across them. There were, I would make my appearance and give my little sermon, and then they'd do it, you know. <laughs> Building relationships. <laughs> nice. Well, um, Let's end our conversation here. Mm -hmm. And thank you to Norm for, for spending some time with us today. Mm -hmm. um, I'd like to open it up to some questions from the audience, if, if you're willing to take some. Great. OK, great. Any thoughts, questions for anyone today? Do you want to use the mic? What's that? Can you talk loud? Can you talk loud, Lito? Yeah, I can talk loud. All right, uh, Fowler. You're going to have to repeat it for me. Sure. Okay. Yeah, or I can repeat. So just go ahead. Yeah. Um, okay, but the way that they think about the fact that they're shot, they're not going to be able to see it. Mm -hmm. So Lito's question is um, Was it a struggle to transition from film, where something needs to last for five minutes or a week or whatever for the shot to be done, versus something that has to stand up to weather and people coming through it over time? Yeah. Um, was that a was that a stretch? There's two answers to that, really. There, uh, there, what we have in a lot of studios are they call them backlot sets, and and uh, there, it's an economic reason to do it. So you can recycle them. When I was working in television, we could have 
New York City and, and the back lot at Universal and four days later we could have San Francisco and two days later we could have Boston. And you, you learn the details that are typical of those cities. And the, the signposts, the stop signs, and signage, you know, the, the signage on your buildings say Golden Gate Cleaners or, or, or Brooklyn Diner or something like that. You, you do things that make people feel like you're there, you know. And then you fill it with cabs from New York and, you know, pedestrians, whatever you do. Lampposts that belong in New York City, the Bishop Crook lamppost, you know, things like that. And, and, and you make it work. So part of it is you have sets that are standing there. And, and, and the fact that they're being shot often is the maintenance for them. And if they don't get shot for a while because it becomes popular to shoot on location rather than on a back lot set, uh, they do deteriorate. They do cost you a lot of money to bring up the par for the next time you want to use them. So, so you do have that problem. And, and, but the other thing is, I was told by a lot of people, you're lucky you're doing um, sets for movies, doing environments for movies, because they're on film and they'll be there forever. You know, so you could look at a movie that was made in 1936 and you could see the environment there. But if they had those buildings, mm -hmm. if, they, if they were real buildings that had been shot, they may have been torn down or remodeled or whatever. So they, I had friends who thought that there was more longevity in the environment in a film mm -hmm. than there was in real life. But the bottom line is, there for us personally, the designers, there are babies, especially when you do the first one. You know, sure. you bring your friends down to see. You got to see what I built on stage twenty-five. Come on down, and you know, you walk into the stage, and a bulldozer is pushing it out the other side. You know, <laughs> <laughs> and so you learn to live with that, and 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 that that is one of the problems. You know, what, whatever your dream was that made everybody happy. First of all, only half of it got into the movie. So only half of what you did is ever seen, you know, and and the other the other problem is it just disappears, and and you get used to it after a while, but when I got into the theme park stuff, that even that changes, you know, like all the attractions that I worked on the design of, E. T. and King Kong and all and all that stuff is all gone, you know, because. What happens is you get everybody to come back and spend their now ninety dollars to get in. You got to have something new for them to look at. So you tear ET out and you put in whatever the, the most current thing is going on. You know, like um, what, what's the car one? Um, uh, Fast and Furious. Fast and Furious. Yeah. Thank you. So you know, Fast and Furious is where ET used to be in mm -hmm. Universal in Los Angeles, mm -hmm. and and it's it, now it's it's all on film and 3D rear projection, both sides of the tram as it goes through. It's it, it's a whole different problem, but Whatever you did for ET is history. It's not there, you know, and and, and uh, so it changes even in theme parks. But most of the stuff stays there, you know. Main Street at Disneyland, New York Street at Universal is still there. You know, they may change one or two facades. When we did T2 3D, which was based on the the Terminator movies, uh, we changed two facades to be buildings that were like the ones that. Um, uh, Hughes had, um, why am I missing his, last, his first name? Mm -hmm. uh, the, the famous uh, aviator and- Oh, Howard Hughes. Howard Hughes, thank you. So Howard Hughes uh, was in aviation and then he decided he wanted to be in movies because he fell in love with Jane Russell. So he bought RKO Studios and made it his studio and made movies and produced movies for a while. So that was the closest thing we could think of as an industrialist character that we could base the, the Terminator entertainment piece was behind his facade, you know. So we tore down two facades and we built an Art Deco building that looked like his headquarters building in Hollywood, you know. So even that stuff, as permanent as it's supposed to be, gets torn down, you know, and other things get put in there. Men in Black caused one of our things to change, you know. So we ended up in New York City where we had European Street at one time, you know, and things like that. So, Oh, are you talking about the, the actual individual set? Well, for, for an individual set, um, like um, New York Street, 
uh, we, when we built that, uh, we based it on the backlot set that was in, uh, um, in Los Angeles that in the thoroughly modern Millie picture that was up there, there was a picture of that street. We based it uh, on, uh, on that street and we built it in Florida. It was called Metropolitan Street in, in Los Angeles. So the tag or the identifier was Metropolitan Street because that meant it was available for any kind of place. But in New York, in Florida, we decided to call it New York Street because we based all, all the buildings, almost all the buildings, on things that you'd seen in movies in New York. So we had uh, Pennsylvania Station from North by Northwest. We had Tiffany's from Breakfast at Tiffany's. We had Macy's from Miracle on 34th Street. We were trying to identify things so you would not only feel like you were in New York City, you would also feel like these are the places they actually made the movies, even though they didn't. You know? so, so we called it New York Street because it was supposed to be New York Street and it was more appealing to the East Coast audience that was going to come down from New York and Philadelphia and, other uh, parts of the Northeast and come to Florida and see the park. So it was the tagline is tuned to make it tuned to make it sell better in the audience that we expect to appear. And a lot, there's a lot of attention that's paid to that kind of stuff. Like, like uh, my the chairman of my division thought that alliteration was great. So it was the hairy, horrible, you know, horrific movie of, you know, makeup, movie makeup, you know, they, he would throw a lot of letters in and things like that. And there was a lot of talk about what it was. And, and his, his way of approaching it was when we were talking about an area or an attraction, a show or a ride, as we'd start to present the designs, he would say, what's on the poster? So to him, if it was going to sell and if people are going to love it, you could put up a movie poster that said what you were going to get. And so that's sort of how the tagline got put on things, is you had to sell the boss on what he was going to see that made me want to put my money on the table and come in. You know? so, so, it, so that became a, a way of understanding what's the tagline, what are we going to call it, what are we going to make it that makes people happy. And it, and it was what will entice them to come in. Well, our, our chairman was basically a P.T. Barnum. He, he knew how much popcorn to make and how much to charge and what was going to make him. If you look at the early attractions at Universal Studio Florida, everybody's in jeopardy. You know, the shark is going to set them on fire. You know, the King Kong is going to rip them out of their tram. You know, whatever, whatever the threat was, it was always something you know, within a four minute time frame, you're going to get in trouble and you're almost going to die and you're going to be saved. You know? and, and the reason it had to be four minutes or seven minutes or whatever it was, you had to get 2,000 people an hour through there. If you didn't, then they were standing in line and they weren't in the stores buying stuff. You know? So it's all based on P.T. Barnum understanding what the crowd will do to give me money. You know? <laughs> so, <laughs> the reality is so Over, you're talking about um, at at uh, Orlando in Orlando. There, that's hard to say. Um, there's reasons why I loved some of it in the Islands of Adventure, which is next door to the studio. I I was really the concept guy on how what it was going to be, what was going to make it islands, and I love that feature about it. You know, what each the big lagoon in the middle. And, and the, how the pieces of land are separated with bridges and all that. I love that. And I love working on Jurassic Park because I was working with Steven Spielberg. Actually, Steven was, he was our, um, our playing card for everybody. So he was the inspiration for everything we did. And so they could advertise that, you know, come ride the movies at, at Universal in environments inspired by Steven Spielberg. So I got to work with him very closely when we did that. And that's a lot of fun. He's a wonderful guy. And I got to work with John Williams who did the music for it because we had that music in our stuff too. And so that made it probably one of my favorite things there was Jurassic Park. But I also loved the Spider-Man ride in Superhero Land because we did things that nobody had ever done before in that where we, we actually had curved screens with 3D projectors 
and you would ride your vehicle into this land, into this city, and you come around the corner and you were actually going into a movie, you know, and, and so you just have real sets, real buildings. You come around the corner and now everything you saw through your 3D goggles was actually a projected image on a screen in front of you. But since it was 3D, you could bring it out. So Spider-Man could jump out and land on the front of your vehicle and your vehicle would dip. It was all coordinated with computers. You know, so he was right there. And then the bad guy would throw a burning pumpkin at you and it would actually come into your lap. Well, all the other attractions there, everything is 40 inches away. So nobody can touch it. Nobody can get hurt by it and, and sue the studio. You know, the shark never came more than 40 inches from you. So you had to be as threatening as you could be 40 inches away where it couldn't be reached. Well, now we were in an attraction where I could pull people into what was a movie and they would think they were still in the 3D world and somebody could actually throw a burning object into their lap we can hit them with heat guns at the same time, you know, from a distance. And they're, oh, oh shit, you know. And, and, you know, to be able to do that, and so I ride the ride after we first put it together, you know, and we're, and we're going through it. We did, there was one place where you came around and we had a painted backing in the front of a building. And the car pointed you at the building and the backing rolled into the floor. So you, the, your feeling was, I'm going up in the air, you know. And, and as soon as you got up in the air, there was a huge 3D screen of New York City, of the buildings and everything out there. You were flying over the city, and then somebody zaps you, and you lose your anti-gravity, and you fall. And so the, the car is only doing this, but the movie is doing this, you know, and so you're going straight down, and then it goes black before you crash, and you're out of it, you know, you're <laughs> on to the next thing. And so to be able to do all those tricks in a way that would, nobody would, had done it before, we outdid Disney. It was the most popular ride in Florida at the time. So. That was part of being at Universal was I got to outdo Disney because now they're going to outdo me and I got to outdo them, you know. So, so, so that, I really loved that attraction because it did it. And I loved the environment because it was weird. It was, a, it was a comic book environment. It wasn't any kind of architecture I had ever done before. And I had a genius working for me who was the art director in charge of it and an architect that was in charge of it who was game to do anything to make it work. And basically, I didn't have to say, this is what it should look like. These guys would come in and say, this is what it should look like. And I would look at the chairman and I'd say, isn't this great? And they'd say, yeah. And so I didn't even do it. They did it, you know. <laughs> but but uh, I still loved it because it was all this unusual stuff to, to do. And, and I rode the ride when, uh, for the first time when it was officially started on opening day in the park. And... Uh, when, when we got to the unloading platform, everybody in the group was cheering and yelling and applauding. And they didn't know who they were cheering, you know, because they were just, they just had a great time. The same thing happened in T2 3D, which was, we had three 3D screens where the monster came out and everybody went like this, you know. And, and, and in the end, we were going down an elevator to go into this lower chamber in, in this huge building we were in it was actually being lowered what they were doing is they were pumping the seats up an inch and a half so every seat in the place went up an inch and a half and the, and the visual image is you're going down on the screens and and once again it's in 3d so you feel like it's really happening so now they got you up in the air an inch and a half in the end when you blow up the monster when when arnold schwarzenegger throws the bomb at him and the monster blows up and they that we uh, ejected smoke out from the bottom of the stage into the audience, uh, a cold nitrogen cloud basically out into the audience with red lights flashing from the floor, making all this sparkle. At that point, we dropped everybody in the place. <laughs> they all screamed. And then they all applaud and they go crazy, you know. And, I, and so the guy that was responsible for the live action in that uh, from a company called Landmark that we had hired to put together the live action parts of it with the with the Schwarzenegger lookalike, he was sitting next to me in the first show that we saw with the audience going crazy. And I looked at him and I said, you pay these people 25 bucks a piece to go crazy? <laughs> you know? So when, when you see that, when you see, it's like if you're, on, you know, if you're in a movie and you're, you're watching Harry Potter and he wins and the audience goes crazy and you're in the theater, it's the payoff. You know, it's like, yep, I guess we got that one right. <laughs> you know? So that's why I like those two rides in Florida, is they were, the payoff, but the environment itself, 
uh, it just it felt like second nature to do New York and to do Amity and to do Hollywood Boulevard and all that. And, and it was just the fun of doing it with everybody, you know, and having it done. And uh, they're memorable to me in the sense that, okay, here's a place that's going to stand up for a while that I helped put together, you know. Mm. That was good. <clears throat> that's great. I think we could probably listen to your stories all evening, but we're going to have to wrap um, before uh, we leave one another, we're going to play a short oh. clip of, um, of some of your work. Yeah. Um, but before we look at that, I just want to ask everyone to thank Norm for this uh, fun afternoon. <laughs> thank you. For, for those of you who stuck it out, thank you very much. <laughs> so I'm going to pop up over to the other side. So I don't want to okay. <laughs> Mel Brooks was a great guy to work with. I really had a fun time. That, that last shot of Scrooge flying through the air and ending up being a silhouette in front of the moon, that was a, uh, a personal joke and a dig at Steven Spielberg because Steven's company, Amblin, is a picture of E.T. on a bicycle with the kids going in front of the moon. That's his logo. So Bob Zemeckis, who was the director of that, he got his start with Steven. So he always has a, something in his movies that, that reminds Steven where he came from. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>